Hi, I'm Dr. Gemma, and welcome back to Cognitive, the Knitting Psychology Podcast. Cheerfully and somewhat irregularly in business since 2008. Segments today may include what's on my hooks, needles, and spindles, a strategy, something I really like, put a lid on it, oh shoot, and blather. So sit back, put your feet up, pick up your knitting, crocheting, spinning, weaving, or dyeing, (laughs) or any other yarny thing you're doing, and get ready to enjoy. Well, hello there. It is Dr. Gemma, and this is episode 140 of the Cognitive Podcast. I am recording this right here, right now, at 5.56 p.m. on, what is this, Monday, July 24th, 2023. What an amazing week. Things have just been wonderful and crazy this summer, and this week was no exception. So let's get on to all the news that we have. Let's see, let's see. First of all, your comments are very welcome. You can comment on the blog at cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com. Do not forget to put the K in cognitive to make the word knit. You can also comment on our group on Ravelry. Meanwhile, let's move on to the warm thanks department. And of course, the first one is to everybody supporting CFR 2023, and I will return to more of that. But I also wanted to thank Reader A., Ridera, Ridera, I've been trying to figure out how to pronounce her name forever. But she also had a good comment on the 911 calls. And I'm going to just quote her. One thing our local 911 always reminds me to do is to put away any pets and unlock the front door. That's very useful if you're asking them to come to your home. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Whenever you're going to have any kind of service calls like that, You really do have to be prepared. You can't just simply let them come in and let everybody, little kids, pets, whatever, run out the front door. That can be very challenging if you're making a 911 call and somebody's on the floor gasping for breath. I mean, this is not an easy thing to manage, and I think that's why Reader A, I'm going to call her, is pointing this out, that you really are not going to have a lot of presence of mind if you're calling from home. And so if you can do it, you want to try to take a deep breath after you finish the call if they're coming to your house and really think about what do I have to do to get them into the house. And also at a moment like that, you can delegate if you're not alone in the house. And that's also a a useful piece of advice. Some people, when they're frightened, they want control. And so they have to do everything themselves. So I'm also going to say, adding to this very good comment, Don't forget that you can ask somebody else to unlock the front door or to put the cats in their crates or the dogs in the yard or whatever. Also, Reader A says, for anyone with a chronic illness, I would recommend keeping a list of your conditions and medications, especially if you have trouble speaking or remembering things when you would be calling 911 or when someone would be calling for you. A medical alert bracelet may also be helpful. The medical alert bracelet is kind of a universal yes, that instead of saying, well, don't forget to tell the ambulance that you've got, say, diabetes, something that's going to affect what kind of meds you can take in an emergency, you really want to have that bracelet, kids. (laughs) And anything that is affecting your meds, you want to consider putting on a bracelet. You can have them carved to your specifications. So do do think of this. For example, on mine, I would say, not only am I type 2 diabetic, but I would say that I take medication for my thyroid as well, hypothyroid. Say which one, not hyper, hypo. So yeah, the medication bracelet is a kind of universal. You should really consider these as you get older. You should consider them if you have chronic illness. They're not hard to find on the internet. The other thing is, yeah, keeping the list of your conditions and medications by the phone is really, really smart. Here's what else is smart. 
keep them on your phone that you should have a place on your phone Apple Health is one place your notes app whether you're on Apple or Android on Apple it's called the notes I don't know what they call it on Android all those places you should have a copy of the meds and the reason is if you go to a hospital and they give you the same meds that you take they're gonna charge you a fortune per pill so you really want to be able to take your meds with you so while you're putting the pets away and waiting for 911 to arrive that is the ambulance or the cops and while you're unlocking the front door you also want to make sure that you're grabbing the meds and you're grabbing that index card you keep next to your phone or you're grabbing your phone and your charger because you're going to want those babies to go with you and you want to going to want to know your meds so thank you I'm just calling you reader A on this one thank you very much for that I really must say too when I posted the thing about the 911 call I really didn't know what everybody's reaction would be and I have to say I've gotten some really really smart comments about that and I'm really grateful for that I don't want to turn into the podcast of doomy doom doom where everybody listens in to hear what to do in a crisis but I have to tell you there are worse roles for a podcaster and I am always sort of stunned I have been stunned many times over the years to have people message me and say this thing you said really helped me that's always a bit of a shock particularly when it's something that I thought was very throwaway and I'm always stunned because it's never wasted and it's a good thing just to remind each other just to pop these things out you never know when someone's going to remember this that there's some little kid listening while their mother is knitting and listening to me and 10 years later this little kid feels confident making a 911 call you just never know so I don't want you to live in a state of panic I want you to live in a state of readiness and I also don't want to be the podcast of doomy doom doom I really would just like everybody to feel good and to feel confident meanwhile back at the podcast and on a lighter note I was very happy when Amy Storm messaged and said she has made it to Sierra Cottons and Wools in Bishop California and I give a big hurrah support them if you ever travel up the eastern Sierra Nevada which is essentially a valley between oh let me think Nevada's completely dirt dry mountains on the right and the insanely beautiful eastern face of the California Sierra Nevada with a little bit of the Mojave Desert down at the bottom you will realize that that is one remote location <laughs> they are out in the middle of nowhere kids it is a fantastic drive I really really recommend it of course you can fly into the area now you, you land just outside Bishop and you can rent cars but we really want to keep Sierra Cottons and Wolves going up there that it is it you know from Reno to LA I think if you take that route straight down let me think about that yeah pretty much from Reno I'm trying to think if you go south and you went on the 14 you'd have to get on the 5 I think the next closest yarn shop would be in the San Fernando Valley and it's arguable which one it would be whether it be Burbank or over a little bit more to the west at any rate what I am telling you is we need Sierra Cottons and Wolves they are it men for that whole corridor the Antelope Valley no longer has anything you'd have to go to the Antelope Valley and then sort of fork up to the northwest into Bakersfield to find a place I'm not even sure if Bakersfield still has a yarn shop I haven't been up there in so long so thank you Amy for making it to Sierra Cottons and Wolves and supporting them and she got some really cool stuff I mean the great thing about that shop is they have a lot of crafty stuff focused on embroidery and knitting in fact actually I think the owner would consider it more about embroidery and the name is Sierra Cottons notice the cotton comes first and wools later but they do a really really decent stock of absolutely great wool and of course I'm happy because they have Malabrigo so thanks Amy for letting me know it's a great store isn't it and then of course knit one pug two talking about the cognitive fiber retreat had a really great suggestion instead of a class what about 15 to 30 minute demo things like 
darning socks, embroidery on knits, specific wheels or drop spindles. Yeah. So let me fill that in because that is a great, great comment in so many ways. First of all, I'm open to that. If anybody wants to do a demo of something unusual. Second, the things you mention. Yeah, I had thought about just bringing along a bunch of tins of watercolor and saying, let's do a quick watercolor thing. Like, let's do a simple project that I learned online from Andrea Nelson or someone like her. And just for fun, just a different thing to do. Darning has been a very big thing. So, yes, people, if you want to show off your darning skills, you could probably do an ad hoc class if you just brought your supplies. I would always be glad to see one of the darning looms. I've got one and haven't had a chance to use it. So anything like that would be very, very welcome. Embroidery on knits, that's another good one. Embroidery on knits is one of those ridiculously easy things to do, and it's incredibly useful, and yet it's really hard to get somebody in one place to show you how to do it. Specific wheels. We almost always get that. That what happens at night, and Knit One Pug 2 you have not been, I believe, so you will not know this, but what happens at night is all sorts of people bring spinning wheels. In fact, the vendors often bring them because they're sitting there all day and they have nothing to do in between classes and the previous CFRs. So they all brought wheels and started to spin. One of the other great traditions of CFR was the previous hotel used to leave the banqueting room open for us. They stopped charging us. They just left it open because they were very grateful for the crowd of people I was bringing into their hotel once a year for a whole weekend. And we used to all just go sit there with our wheels and all sorts of things went on in those evenings in the banqueting room. I mean, those were tremendously wonderful that people would spin, people would knit or crochet, People would do a lot of things. People brought food, snacks, cookies, which you're very welcome to do. We just had so much fun in those evenings. And I have to say, now, I was running back and forth, trying to keep everything from burning to the ground, trying to put the fires out, whatever. And poor Loretta was usually being dragged right behind me. So for me, those evenings, I hate to admit this, were the high points. The best moment for me has always been when I walk in the first time and I see all these people and they're so excited. The second best thing has been those evenings. And that's where I learned a lot about wheels. One time, I believe I mended two wheels back when I was working really hard on understanding how wheels worked and I was repairing wheels. All of that was so much fun to show people how that works and the logic there. So yes, specific wheels. Definitely bring your wheel because it's a great way to advertise what you like about your wheel. That includes electric wheels. Towards the end, we had a lot of electric wheels going. A lot of Hansons, as I recall. Also, she says, what about demonstrating drop spindle? Hardy, har, 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 har. I used to always try to have one person selling drop spindles. And this year, I don't think we have anybody. Ooh, Alpenglow, if you're listening. Woohoo, Alpenglow our tech goddess. Maybe I'll write to you if you're not, but we could use you doing us some really cool drop spindles, eh, girl? Uh, am I missing something? I think you're doing 3D printing, which means you could be printing us drop spindles and selling them. I'm just saying, because I have to tell you, you don't need a 15-minute demo of drop spindling. You need a 15-minute class. That drop spindling is so easy to learn and so incredibly useful to know. I could go on and on about that. I learned my drop spindling at CFR, but I couldn't get to the drop phase. I could only do park and draft. Let me explain that. You park the spindle, the shaft of it, you sort of hold it still, usually sort of between your knees, and you then draft the wool or the fiber, and then you pick up the spindle and you spin it and then you wind it on and so in other words you're not going fast you're going really slow if you only learn park and draft that's going to be really really important if you've never spun at all especially because that's going to teach you the mechanics of the whole business what are we doing here and when you get your first wheel you're going to know how to spin intuitively how do i know this 
because I never wanted to spin. I finally gave up and learned at my own fiber retreat. I learned how to do park and draft and I couldn't get it right. And then the wonderful Stashy Mama came to my house and showed me and she tried to get me to then drop the spindle because that makes everything go faster. I couldn't get it. And wonderful Anne just said, don't worry about it. Just, just let it be right where you are. And I was very frustrated, but said, okay. Anne really read me like a book. And I went to Stitches West low these many years ago. And someone from the San Jose Spinning Guild, I believe, taught me in five minutes how to actually drop the spindle and keep it going. And then I bought a spinning wheel. I bought a Lendrum from, I can't remember her name because I don't think she's still in business, but I bought a Lendrum. She was up in San Francisco and I went to pick it up that Christmas and my husband helped me pay for it as part of his Christmas gifts to me. And I went to pick it up and she said, oh, you better let me teach you to spin. And I looked at the wheel and it was like magic. I saw a giant drop spindle disc turned on its side. And I said, that's very kind of you, but we have to go. It's getting late. We have to get to a hotel. I said, there is no problem. I know how to do this. And she said, well, you better show me. Bless her heart. I did. I sat down and I immediately spun. No hesitation. Because once you get it, you get it. That spinning makes enormous sense. It's very simple physics, very simple mechanical physics. And you get that all from a drop spindle. So I really hope we can get someone, hint, hint, up and glow, to bring us some 3D printed spindles for sale. And we can do this. I just think it's such an amazing skill to have. Okay, so thank you for that all, Knit One Pug Two. This leads me to talk about the Cognitive Fiber Retreat. Can you believe it's taken me 16 minutes to get here? No, you probably can't. CFR, things are rolling along very beautifully. The show notes, that's where you go to get the summary. I think the only recent changes, I want to point out that you, your last day to pay the attendance fee is September 1st, 2023. After that, it's going to be first come, first serve. If somebody sends me an attendance fee, someone else is getting bumped off the list. Okay, so we're going to finish that. I want to clean that up because I really, by then, need to make plans to buy items. The other thing, I tried to work on the goodie bags this week. I had limited success. I did get a good note drafted and then could not get it loaded for some reason on Etsy. But I had a really good time. I identified like 50 places. And so also I will be collecting all of their URLs. And that will also be available to you. I don't think I'll put the paper list in your goodie bag because that's a waste of space and time and paper. But I should post it in the show notes somewhere or as an addendum maybe not to a podcast episode's show notes, but as a separate set of notes so that you can see that anybody who sends us anything for the goodie bags, we really want to support them. So I'm working on that. That's now underway, which is nice. Everything else, let's see, you probably know it by heart and could sing with me at this point. I do want to point out that Lefty Rebel Knitter just to make sure you know, yes, I got your money. Thank you. You're now on the list in red. And our own Kimmel, thank you, thank you, thank you for catching the fact that you had paid. And I did have you in my bookkeeping. I'm very careful. The minute I get a payment, it goes right into the Excel file. But I had forgotten, or I somehow copied an old list, I suspect, into the show notes. So I'd forgotten to put your name in red. So, Kim, you are there. And we know you paid. And do not worry anymore. Beyond that, our wait list right now, it's our own Monica Little Fence. And Monica, you know, at this point, I'm pretty sure you're going to get in anyway because 51 people versus 50. Really? Is that a problem? No, not really. So hang in there. After September 1st, I'm probably just going to say pay me if you want to get in because I just don't think that's a big issue. All the vendors have confirmed I have not heard from our own Tina at Tina's Soaps. Like I said, I'm not particularly worried about that. The other beautiful thing is that Brenda Castile, who is a wonderful designer and pretty well published, she's called Good Stuff as well. 
she sent me a message saying, just so you know, Laura of the Disney Blonde Studios. Sorry, I know about five dyers named Laura. This makes me want to bang my head into the wall, so I'm sorry, Laura, if I'm choking up. But Laura from Dizzy Blonde Studios, alias Naughty LA, she, you may remember, is doing our sea glass colorway. And so Brenda says yes, and she and I are planning to offer a custom shawl design that is inspired by the beautiful yarn. We also have an idea to offer a bundle, yarn pattern, and coordinating exclusive design project bag. Holy manoli, kids! That's wonderful. That's just wonderful. So that will be one option if you want a memento, and I'm really pleased about that. I also want to point out that Laser Sheep Yarns, who just had a fairly large sale, she is also making us a show special colorway, and I think she's catching up on a few other projects that are more local to her. So anybody Please send pictures. I will promote this. I want to promote your work. This is why you are considered friends of the podcast. And that, by the way, includes our soap maker, too. Any pictures you want to send me, I will try to print. And I'm suddenly going, wait, Tina, you may have sent me some. Am I forgetting this? At any rate, send me the pictures. <laughs> I really want to post things and promote them. And the mini skein swap is on. And the list of patterns and techniques is there. The raffle, of course, I've probably said a million times. Mother Bear Project, get making those bears. Every completed bear you bring, you will get an extra raffle ticket. Please be aware that you have to have it completed in the morning. Please don't bring it up to me in the middle of the day because we do the raffle in the morning. <laughs> it's very simple. It's very straightforward. So I, I know right now there's going to be a bunch of you sitting up Friday nights doing these last-minute bear fixes. Go you. And I've talked about the goodie bags. I've talked about the classes. So that means we must be on to what's on my hooks and needles. Holy manoli, I finished the Lady Eleanor shawl, and it is breathtaking. Actually, technically, it's called the Lady Eleanor Stole. It's from the book Scarf Style by Pam Allen and... I believe it has some participation from Interweave Knits. This is an older book. Indeed, Scarf Style is from 2004. So this one has been around a long time. You really should go look it up. There's a link in the show notes to my Ravelry page for my shawl, for my stall, whatever you want to call it. I have to tell you, just go to that link and go to Ravelry and then follow through to the pattern page for the Lady Eleanor and then look at all the finished projects, you will just drop dead in wonder. They are so beautiful. Now, I believe in her original, she uses like 1,200 yards, but some of that goes into the long, elegant fringe, which is a very pretty thing. I've seen it a few times in real time, and it's very, very pretty. But most people dedicate themselves to using the 1,200 yards. So for me, this was 11 skeins of some very old Noro right out of my stash that I bought back in about 2006 precisely for this project. So that's really nice. Got them all out of the stash. Very, very nice. Got some space in one of my bins. Of course, what I did, I couldn't get enough of the main color I wanted. So I got a coordinating color in Noro. That can be pretty exciting. This was from a now defunct yarn store in Ventura, California. And it worked out great. I am here to tell you the two coordinating colorways means that it all works, but I had extra colors in there than I would have expected had I only used one Noro skein. So, oh man. And then I, what I did was I got to skein number 10 of 11. And at skein number 10, I stopped and I cut the strings for the fringe from skein number 11 because I measured the shawl and realized, okay, it, it wants it to be, I think, 70 inches dry or something. I don't remember. But anyway, I had that. So I said, good. And also, you have to end on row one followed by the end triangles, okay? So I was in the middle of scheme 10, so that's all going to work. And I'm going to get as much as I can out of this. Obviously, I don't want leftover yarn here. So I cut the fringe. All right. So then I went in and I finished the entrelock part. It was huge. Thank goodness I blocked it before I added the fringe. 
but I did block it, and you probably saw that, the pictures of that, where it really, really stretched. Noro has a way of doing that. And Noro, this was Corian, and I don't remember the composition, but it didn't spring back a lot, which was great. It makes the shawl very, very big and generous, which is exactly what I wanted. But the thing has got to be 80 inches long now that it's blocked. So I said, oh my gosh, if I put the fringe, now the fringe was meant to be something like, well, you were cutting out 40 inch lengths. And so the fringe, you were knotting it, but I still think that was going to come out adding something like at 20 to 30 inches on each side, which meant this thing would have, you know, been the stole that ate Manhattan by the time I was finished with it. And I looked at it and I said, yeah, it's just too long to have the fringe. The fringe will be dragging on the ground if I'm not careful. So instead I went with tassels, which meant I took the original strings I cut and I just cut them in half. So now they were 20 inch lengths, which means they'll fold over in tassels to be 10 inches. And I thought, that's pretty good. I measured it. I sort of looked at that and said, yeah, I like that. So then I just cut up the rest of my yarn, divided it evenly, and did the tassels. It came out perfect, just perfect. This is one of those projects, very much like my temperature blanket, very much like Blanket's own blanket, where you look at it and you go, wow, that's heirloom. I mean, that's just so good. That should be around forever. So I am deeply, deeply happy about the Lady Eleanor. And also the stash toss, that means we have eight in versus 42 skeins out. I did not count all the skeins of this stole, all 11 of them, because I did start it in October. And I think by the time we got to January 1st, I think I was seven skeins in. So I only got to add those last four. I am a pretty happy puppy though. The four skeins from Knit Picks arrived for my planned sweater. So now we're eight skeins in and 42 skeins out since January 1st. I went back to work on the lane splitter skirt. I have to admit, I figured out right away why I stopped. It's a great skirt. I did a lot of measurements on myself before I started up again to make sure I was on track. I think I've got 40 inches and I need 44 probably not. I could probably go to 42. I did all the measurements, as I said, so when I get to 42 inches on that side, I'm going to stop and look at how it fits before I keep going. But it's it's boring. It's a very boring skirt, but it's really great. The, out, the product is so great. It's a really handsome skirt, so that's very nice. That leaves the Pennsylvania Dutch embroidery, not yet, but Minerva's Meow socks I'm on sock number two and I'm past the waist yarn for the heel. So that's coming to a close, which hopefully will push me on to the Pennsylvania Dutch embroidery. I have to have something to carry with me. So I have several projects that are queued up right on my Ravelry page that are not even started. But I really want to get through these old projects. I don't like having them around. Meanwhile, Joanne Fabrics had Firefly Madness. I forgot about that, that they do that kind of in the middle of the dog days of summer. I really don't know when they do it. It was far better than their July 4th sale and marginally better than their Memorial Day sale, but they're really doing it to empty a lot of the winter's stock and the winter themed stock from their store, including the flannels. So everything dropped to the ground. So, of course, I was buying all this $3 a yard fabric. What was nice was there were two flannels I had my eye on. And I kept saying, if those survive, there's enough. I'm going to buy those at the next really good sale. Well, this was the next really good sale. All I can tell you is I use five yards of my full circle skirts. Well, I'm going to have two new $15 full circle skirts. And in a wonderful flannel, both of the flannels are gorgeous. One is a kind of watercolor that's blue-based with dark stamped dragonflies on it. And the other is a sort of pseudo-tapestry with a bluish-black background. And yes, unicorns, but the unicorns are not loud and screaming little girl. It's very subtly done. They're both very handsome. Meanwhile, I picked up cotton broadcloth, which is a polyester cotton blend, to do two more pairs of shorts because really... Are you going to turn down $6 shorts? I'm certainly not, particularly when you know they will fit you the way you want them to. They will be comfortable, and in my experience, they're going to last a long time. 
So again, yes, I know you can get $6 shorts at Old Navy, but I'm going for the elastic waistband that's incredibly comfortable and disappears handily beneath my t-shirts. So my new uniform in the summer is I'm wearing my nine seam cotton skirts on my working days, usually with a polo top or a very nice short sleeve top above it. And on my days off, I'm wearing my favorite t-shirts from the places I've been with these broadcloth shorts. I am a pretty happy camper, let me tell you. So I'm skipping past the favorite resources, all the links of the stuff I use and would like you to know about, and Dizzy Blondes as well, because I'm not spinning, I know, tour de fleece. I have to live vicariously through you other good spinners. However, let's get on to a strategy. Lately, I've been running into the same strategies over and over in my practice, which I find kind of interesting. This week, I originally was going to say, check your ego before you do anything, because it was a very big thing this week. And I realized that that comes down to examining the pros and cons of a decision, which is sort of a mindfulness thing. Now, the thing is, it's easy to talk about before you make any decision, examine the pros and cons. And everybody listening is nodding along with me because we all know that one and it makes so much sense. And yet, how often do we all do it? But the interesting thing to me is why don't we do it? Like, why would you not stop, examine the pros and cons and figure out what works for you? Well, the answer is often your ego gets tangled up in it. And I'll be talking about that more when I get to the blather. But the reality is we don't stop when we have a difficult decision or a tough choice. We don't stop to say, why should I do this? Why should I not do this? Because a lot of times we're saying, I don't have to do that. I shouldn't have to do that. That's not fair. That's not right. You're not giving me respect. You're not blah, 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 blah. You're not treating me right. I have to tell you now, as a brief aside, I hope, I get nervous when I'm on Instagram or Facebook because I see these memes go by. Someone is just not keeping up with you. Ditch them and move on without them. There's a truth to that. I mean, there are people you need to get out of your life who are toxic. But there's also this middle ground where you say, this person said or did something that hurts me, but actually there are a lot of compelling reasons to maintain a good relationship with them. They're a family member. They're a colleague at work. I'm not talking about you commit some horrendous crime, but I am saying that if people say something rude to you, you know, a lot of times you do learn to say, well, that's just Uncle Bob and he's going to do this kind of thing. Okay, and you have to kind of say, yep, that you know, oh my gosh, Minerva's kneading my leg and it's causing me exquisite pain here. She ah, just jumped in my lap. Yeah, I know, I'm screaming in pain. Do you think you could not do that? No, kissing me won't make it better. Retracting your claws would make it better. I just have a little strategy for you here. Could you retract your claws? Yes, you kissed me and I will pet you with that so you feel like I'm bathing you, but you still need to retract your claws. Okay. What the heck was I saying? Oh, yes. So, you know, there are people in our lives where we have to keep them in our lives, whether we want them there or not. There are compelling reasons to keep them there, no matter how hard they are to live with. And that can include some really uncomfortable stuff. Your grandparent with Alzheimer's who got kind of mean with the illness. You know, this isn't easy stuff. So the question has to become, is my ego entangled with my decision? Like, particularly if you're saying, like, I just need to get rid of this person. They're just toxic. You need to sort of say, are they? Or even if they are, is there a compelling reason that you have to maintain good relationships with them? And this is what sets you into the pros and cons, where you really need to just slow everything down and think about this. And sometimes you need to just write the list and sleep on it. Yes, I did say sleep on it. Plenty of research. People make better decisions after they have a good night's sleep. Number one, because they're rested. But number two, often in our dreams, we do work on problems. And we may not remember the dream or we may not even dream it. It may be in the deep subconscious, but we know that humans do this. So it is really important that if you're going to make any kind of a decision, you really examine the pros and cons. 
And if you find yourself resisting that, like, why should I have to think of that? There aren't any pros to keeping this friendship, for example. You may have to stop yourself and say, is this also about my ego? Has my pride been injured? Do I feel like I have to do this drastic thing because my ego has been insulted? And is it really worth that? Or would it be easier to just put your ego to the side and let the situation continue because you still are going to benefit from it more than anything else. I have to say too, if you're looking at the ACT hexagon here, acceptance and commitment therapy, really what I'm talking about is diffused thought that you don't want to be rigid. You hurt my feelings, so you got to go. Anybody who hurts me has to go. I do know people like this and they will use it in the terms of respect. You are not showing me sufficient respect, so you have to go. I'm always very careful when someone uses the R word, you're not respecting me enough. Because it's also often the R word, you're just rigid, aren't you? You're just rigid. You're afraid to work this out with me. You're afraid to trust me enough to work this out. You are not sure you know how to solve the problem. Okay, so this is about cognitive diffusion. In the good sense, diffusion meaning I'm not fused. I'm not rigid. My thoughts are not glued into position. And again, this also harks back to the other corner of the hexagon, which is acceptance. Okay, and you could argue self as context. That I can just accept you for the way you are without judgment. And I don't need to get myself, <laughs> well, as my British friends would say, I don't need to get my knickers in a twist. This is just who you are. I'm going to go off, take a deep breath and let you be who you are. And also self in context, I am not glued in one place. I can accept you for who you are. I can allow myself to fluctuate a little, to change, to tolerate you. So the strategy is if you want to examine the pros and cons, remember you may also have to check your ego before you even speak. In the fluffy books, I am now on, I think book seven of the Bridgerton books. And I'm thinking, oh yeah, it's interesting because she uses the eighth kid for the seventh book. Usually she's been following the order of birth of the fictional Bridgerton children. And I think here in book seven, she goes to child number eight. And I'm assuming book eight is about child number seven. I don't remember the name of it. It's just one of the Bridgertons by Julia Quinn because they have such trifling names. And I'm reading them in these collected editions that are unabridged, but it's three books per volume. So I'm on volume three, which is books seven and eight. I don't know if it's got anything extra there, but I'm really enjoying it. I didn't really watch TV this week. I've been really tired this week. The heat is zapping me hard and I've had a very full schedule and actually I'm really enjoying it because I got a little behind on my sleep, but also I was taking Benadryl at night and I actually think that began to interfere with my function during the day. And so I dropped that and my allergies have been really good because the hubs and the beloved son cut down all the weeds. And now we're working on prevention stuff like laying down cardboard in select places so that some of the weeds don't grow back. I'll come back to that. At any rate, so I've been feeling really, really good and catching up on sleep and this should be in the blather. So on to something I really like. I mentioned it last episode and that is the Scrappy Sock Knitting Group on Facebook. If you're going to bring mini skeins to CFR 23 and you're going to learn more about using mini skeins, this is a really great place to go. They have all sorts of patterns, all sorts of inspiration. From them, I learned helix knitting, which I talked about a little bit last episode before my brain began to smoke and I had to stop. When I say my brain began to smoke, I don't mean it was using cigarettes. For those of you who are a little more concrete, I mean that I was kind of mentally overheating when I tried to talk about Helix knitting. So there you go. The other thing I really like, my friend Carla, alias Quantum Quadrat, introduced me by means of her wish list on Ravelry, to these beautiful floral mugs done by Burton and Burton. And it's B-U-R, not B-E-R, T-O-N, not T-E-N. How could they make this more confusing? But they have these beautiful floral mugs that to me look like watercolors of flowers with, it would be, okay, wet brush on dry paper, like a little more detailed, not just free flowing watercolor. I love these things. I've got two of them now. One is just roses 
And I think the other is the rose and violets or pansies, rose and pansies. Anyway, I've got the rose and pansies one there. And these things are 16 bucks on Amazon. And they're also 16 ounces. When you finish with the taxes and all that, they're usually about 20 bucks. But these are really satisfying. They're very deep, strong, well-made porcelain. And I love me a good porcelain mug. And this is a very generous porcelain mug. So I have two of these and I'm looking to collect. I think there's a third. And they have some mugs with sayings that I would frankly go to someone else like Poly Studios if I wanted to get those or Jam PDX. But I have to say these florals are very, very pretty. And I just got my second one this week and I've been enjoying it massively with my morning tea, which does lead us to put a lid on it. I'm working my way through the Earl Grey blends that I got in a kit. And most of them are not long term. I think they're just experimenting to see what their audience likes. Of course, when I say they, I mean Plum Deluxe. And that's okay. But I am disappointed because the insanely good Lady Grey has now gone away. Oh, I love that stuff. So I have been looking for a very good Earl Grey variant. And then I realized I do have one, and that is Plum Deluxe's Gratitude Blend. It is not the party in your mouth that Lady Grey is, but the Gratitude Blend is really, really quite good. I also got their strawberries and, I think it's strawberries and rose cream or something like that. And that's really good, although it's not an Earl Grey. So I'm drinking my way through the remnant of that. So right now where we are, I have just ordered, yes, more from Plum Deluxe because I'm really ripping through their tea. But in terms of the tea tasting, I'm upcycling my tins from Harney's because I really am just done with Harney's. I can't get clarity from them on the sugar issue. So I'm upcycling the tins by just taping the labels from the little bags that I get my Plum Deluxe in onto the fronts of those tins and I'm very happy. Meanwhile, I have now two house teas, basically an Earl Grey and a black tea. The Earl Grey right now is Plum Deluxe's Gratitude Blend. The black tea is a Ceylon from a company based in Singapore called Dilma's, and they're really, really great. I first enjoyed them when I was in Fiji with the family. And yes, you can order them, and they're doing it the good old hard way, ordering from family farms. They're, they seem to be an ethical producer. So that's very nice. So those are my black teas for the morning. The herbals, I am drinking Plum Deluxe's Pears and Cinnamon Blend and also their Watermelon Mint. And I'm going through these like a house on fire. I just love them. I would like to select some good rooibos teas. I have really not just gotten down to it. I know I've had a few good ones, but I'm not focused on that right now. I'm waiting for the winter to come back. I should also point out the beginning of every winter when you get that first cold snap, I do become a slave to pumpkin spice. And I believe I've got some of that from both Harneys and Plum Deluxe. In the meantime, remember what I just said about teas with sugar. Well, I've been watching a company called Snarky Teas. It is a woman owned company. From Snarky a while back, I got a lovely kit with a big, big column shaped tea diffuser. And it fits into a pint or quart, I believe, jar, mason jar. And it's a good way to put loose leaf tea in and then let it steep overnight. And then you have a lovely jar full of what can be iced tea, cold brew iced tea, or you can heat it up, I suppose. But it's really great for your summer tea making. And so I was very interested in Snarky. And finally, they came out and stated they do not add sugar or sweeteners so they're not steeping their tea leaves in sugar. I am way cool with that. So Snarky Teas is now in my good books along with Plum Deluxe. And there's a whole new place to go exploring. Meanwhile, in the blather, the pup date, we are working on getting Queenie to calm down indoors. And that's been going very nicely. This is her remaining issue. She is a natural herder. And she also wants to please desperately. So Queenie's idea of pleasing you, if you praise Queenie, she is extremely smart. And she knows what she wants to be praised for and what she could care less about. So training, she could care less unless there's food involved, very much like Eleanor was. But 
there are some things that if you praise her, it's very hard to tell her, no, 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 I didn't want you to do that. I just thought it was cute. One of them is when she comes indoors, she likes to race around and jump up and down on the furniture, jump on and off. And she also likes to go into my study and find something soft and squishy, like one of my teddy bear collection, teddy bears my son gave me when he was younger, or a lovely soft squishy skein of very good quality yarn. She doesn't tend to do anything to them. She may mouth them a little bit, but she doesn't actually tend to chew them apart. Unlike a certain black cat I could name who eats them, eats the yarn, I mean. So anyway, there's a lovely picture of Queenie and I working together. She's giving me a big smooch and I'm laughing and holding the camera because I could not resist taking a picture of it. She is such a sweetheart. She's a pretty thing. And now that she and Captain have been groomed, they are both much nicer to have around. So we're looking at scheduling routine groomings a little more frequently because it is really nice to have them groomed down in the house. In the meantime, Hubs date, the Hubs and the Beloved Son are still sprucing up the place. We have weeds galore down in the corral and they've moved on to those. And I, meanwhile, have been gardening. And so there's a picture of me brandishing my new set of trowels, which were just an Amazon set from a place called Garden Tech, and I love them. Last night, when things were cooling down, I donned my sleeves, and there's a picture of me brandishing one of my farmer's defense sleeves, and I'm also wearing a mask. People keep saying, is there smoke? No, it's for pollen. I'm very allergic to everything in the garden. And I'm also, in one picture, wearing my gardener's gloves from Farmer's Defense as well, which I'm very happy with. Okay, so there I am wearing all my gear, and that is because my plants, my pollinators did come, and that was very interesting. This is from a place called Great Garden Plants. I put the link to Great Garden because today I went plant shopping in my region and found that actually what I was thinking was high prices, on the Great Garden Plants site, they're actually incredibly reasonable. They are very comparable to the prices I would pay here. And the plants arrived, all eight of them, in beautiful shape. They were packed sideways in cardboard with a lot of air circulation. And they had plastic wrapped right up to the base of the plant to hold the really beautiful, rich soil in around them in their quart pots. So they arrived in really good shape. One has had a little difficulty. One of the milkweeds just did not respond well to travel. It came in good shape, but it just has been drying up. We can't seem to revive it very successfully. And then of course there was the stone crop, which fell right out of its planter as we were unpacking. And I just crammed it all back in and he's out in the yard now and he's doing great. So you can see a picture there of some of them just at twilight last night planted with their pots next to them to help the boys identify that these are real cultivars, don't weed them out or kill them, and also to teach them what the names of the plants are, but I'll be the one doing that. So now there are links in the show notes to Farmer's Defense for the sleeves, the gloves, hats, aprons, they even have cutting shears for 10 bucks. And there's also a link to Great Garden Plants who I will be returning to. They did a great job. And they had a way better selection of region-appropriate plants than our local gardening stores down in Palmdale had, which blew my mind. And then there is the great announcement in the calendar. And that is simply this week. I had one of those situations where I had to do the pros and cons, but to do it, I had to move my ego out of the way. The end result was, after September 1st, I will no longer work on Saturdays. I will instead work Mondays. This has a lot of ramifications for me and for the therapy group I work with, but on my side, it means a lot of things. One is I was struggling with them over the Monday holidays thing, that they really had one view of the situation and I had another, and they weren't being unfair, I might add, but it wasn't working out. I was actually losing money on the holidays, if that makes any sense. I'm not going to go into it. But I can understand their view. And I realize this is me getting worked up about nothing, about me saying, no, 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 you have to follow my view. And I just thought, wow, what got into me? So when I opened myself to that and just said, what would happen if I didn't work Saturdays? What would happen to me? And they can manage what happens to them if I'm not there on Saturdays, which I don't think is really an issue. But at any rate, 
But I realize if I work on Mondays, first of all, I start getting three-day weekends and appropriate pay for that without struggling with anybody. And I start getting enough time off without struggling with anybody. And I don't have to beg or demand or whatever it was I was doing around policy issues. And this is a good employer. I don't want to do that with them. They're actually really quite good. But it also means this year I won't be using vacation days for CFR 2023. 20, I will have fewer vacation days required for Romule. I mean, this is really one of the best things ever. And I have to say about 99.5% of the problem with this whole scheme was my ego. And when I stopped and I looked at it, I realized, yeah, and of course, I go to my husband at moments like this because he's really good at reality testing. And he basically said, without judgment, he just said, you need to go to Monday through Fridays. Why are you doing this? Why are you arguing this with them? They're not being unreasonable. They just don't see it your way. And I thought, you know, he might be right. So anyway, I came around to that. And the interesting thing was my response. What I didn't expect was I was tremendously emotional about the change once I let it happen. And I was emotional because I realized I'm so relieved and I suddenly realized I'm going to get enough vacation time this year and I'm going to be fine and I'm going to have more time off on the appropriate days so I can go to conferences, including evolution of psychotherapy. And I just thought, why did I get in my own way so much here? This didn't have to ever be a problem. I was being the problem. So it's really been revealing to look at things this way and to realize that a huge amount of this was just my ego. I was trying to push people to make changes that they had no reason to make, frankly. And so, you know, it, it was me, guys. <laughs> so it was really helpful to look at this. And I realized thinking of it in terms of strategy was this was really always about the pros and cons. But I wasn't able to get to that because I had my own ego stuck in front of all that. So, wow. And I'm so happy because, of course, it makes sense. We're at the end of July, so my patients need a clear date as a marker. And this is really nice because September 1st, everybody will get it. That's a clear date. The, the people in our admin, the patients, gave me a lot of time. Three out of my six Saturday patients are already packed away in new spots. And the other three are working on it, and that's going to work out too. They have four more weeks to figure this out. So this is all excellent, and I'm very, very pleased with it. What a relief. So I guess in the calendar, after September 1st, well, first of all, September 2nd, of course, is a Saturday, and I will take that off, and then I will have Labor Day, coincidentally, on my birthday. So I'm going to get that three-day weekend for my birthday. Oh, man, it's working out. So I'm so relieved. In the meantime, yes, you all know that CFR 2023 is Saturday, November 11th, 2023, a day which I have off and do not have to request now as a vacation day. And you also will know that the Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference is in Anaheim, California, at the Convention Center, sitting right on top of Disneyland. That is December 12th through 17th, and I think the 16th is a Saturday, and coincidentally, I'll have that off too. So I now suddenly have that whole weekend for Anaheim, and that takes a lot of pressure off me for getting to enough sessions to earn my continuing ed. Why, why, why am I so stubborn? So Minerva gets the last word, and you can see that Minerva in that picture is staying on top of things. In fact, she's sitting on the internet router, or rather she's keeping it warm, and she's above the trash can and above some of my creative supplies for fizzy bath things. And she is right on top of things, and that means when you're sitting up on top, you get a much more clear view of the world. And of course, every cat knows that. And that is why they're always trying to sit in high places. This is because they feel like prey. And so they're trying to keep an eye on the landscape to make sure nobody's going to come along and eat them. But they also are predators and they're keeping an eye out for the next good thing to come along. And it's kind of amazing because they aren't prey as long as they're living safely with us and we're not letting them outside in coyote country here they're actually just fine but they feel like they're threatened and maybe that means that their ego gets in the way too so having said that i'm gonna say be like minerva stay on top of things but remember you're not really 
pray as long as you're keeping an eye on things. Right now, as we speak, she is trying to eat her dead fur that I brushed out of her to use for spinning. So if I sound a little funny, that's me leaning forward. She is on top of things right now. She's on top of my craft table. So having said that, wow, November is rapidly marching towards us. I'm excited to see so many of you again. In the meantime, do not forget that you need to get all your shots and you might need masks just as a precaution before CFR 2023. But we are a community when we take care of ourselves. That way we take care of each other. When we take care of each other, we take care of ourselves. So on that happy note, everybody, stay safe, take care of each other, and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. So we have come to the end of another episode of Cognitive. Please do not use this podcast to diagnose yourself. If you think you are having a mental health problem, please contact a licensed mental health professional. Show notes for these episodes can be found at cognitivepodcast, all one word, dot blogspot.com. Episodes can be found at iTunes under the name Cognitive Podcast, but also can be found posted next to the show notes on the Blogspot page. Thank you so much for listening. Everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.